Very good. Uh, okay, well, welcome to panel number three. Uh, is Lisa Orloff here? Oh, Lisa, yeah, could you, oh yeah. There, we got her, we got her. So we're gonna start um, uh, with, uh, with our uh, presentation. We have uh, several different presentations and, uh, and then we have some cases, but uh, I was thinking that so far in the panels that we've had thus far, we haven't had much in the way of audience questions, so I thought we're happy to go through the cases, but we're also happy at the end, especially with such a wonderful uh, group of uh, panelists, uh, to open it up for some questions. Nodal disease with papillary carcinoma is common and very frustrating sometimes to deal with. And so, okay, great. So uh, we would be happy to move forward with questions rather than the cases if, if that's uh, of interest. So we'll open it up for questions. So as the presentations go on, think about questions that you might want to uh, think about. Uh, so basically, this is the nodal assessment and management, so detection and management of nodal disease. You've already heard some of the kind of elements of this discussion, that which is not there, that which is there but can't be seen and may not be important to dissect, and that which is there, big and bulky and very morbid to deal with and obviously present. So those are some of the things we'll be dealing with, and the tools to manage this would be x-rays perhaps may have utility in the identification phase of our discussions, that is ultrasound, perhaps even axial imaging in certain circumstances. And then the, the issues we want to deal with are how can we manage it? Observation, uh, radio frequency, ethanol ablation, surgical management, prophylactic surgical management, therapeutic uh, management, uh, that in the central neck, that in the lateral neck. So those are some of the elements that we'll be discussing. We have now Lisa Orloff. Uh, from California, a head and neck surgeon who has written a book on ultrasound and has written many papers on that. Uh, Dr. Robert Levine, a colleague of mine from New Hampshire with uh, extreme expertise in ultrasound and interventional ultrasound. Dr. Dougherty, chair at uh, Brigham, uh, who is, uh, has written uh, some of the foremost work on central neck dissection, including prophylactic central neck dissection, and his work has been incorporated very much in the uh, ATA <laughs> guidelines in that regard. And then also Jeff Thompson, a good friend and professor of surgery from Mayo Clinic, who has written extensively on papillary carcinoma, including its nodal management, and can review his Mayo experience and personal experience in this regard. So we have a superb panel, and that's why I'd kind of like at the end of the presentations to have you be thinking about steeping on some questions that may be worthwhile. We have, it's rare that we can have such expertise gathered on one podium. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Orloff. Could you draw up uh, Dr. Lisa's uh, slides there? Thank you so much, Greg, and uh, for the privilege of speaking on this panel and actually for being a uh, participant and an audience member at, at such a wonderful World Congress. So it's, it's wonderful to be here, and I'm going to try to limit my comments to 10 minutes so that everybody gets a fair chance to present their perspective on lymph node uh, assessment and evaluation. And uh, so we all know that thyroid uh, that ultrasonography is the preferred method of imaging for the thyroid gland. It provides the best detail and definition of the background texture and characteristics of the thyroid as well as lesions within the thyroid gland. Ultrasound can help to, uh, uh, it can enable monitoring of the thyroid gland over time and monitoring in the setting of thyroid cancer. And in the same sense, ultrasonography can apply, be applied to the extrathyroidal neck. So in order to perform what is often called lymph node mapping with ultrasonography, it's important to understand the neck anatomy and to understand terminology and the documentation and communication of compartments of the neck. And uh, the topic of this particular panel is assuming that this is going to be a preoperative setting and so we'll be, we will be mapping disease for the purpose of surgical extirpation. But whether you perform ultrasonography yourself or whether you uh, collaborate with a radiologist or an endocrinologist to uh, obtain information about lymph nodes in the neck, it's really uh, important that either you document thoroughly or you ask that thorough documentation be provided by uh, 
your sonographer in order to communicate the locations and uh, the characteristics of the nodes that are identified. So the problem with thyroid cancer and the thyroid gland in general is that it's a central organ or gland in the neck and it has lymphatic drainage in 360 degrees. And if you look hard enough, you can find lymph node metastases in up to 90% of patients. So Greg just mentioned the category of that which is there and can, is not visible and can be left ignored or left uh, undetected. But uh, our task in part today is to help clarify that which is there but should be identified and not missed in the process of evaluating and then planning a surgical procedure. So uh, the neck is broken into the central neck and the lateral neck, and the central compartment boundaries are the hyoid bone superiorly and the innominate artery inferiorly. And even within this compartment, the lymph nodes are not continuous or contiguous. They are uh, separated into prelaryngeal nodes in the midline and then paratracheal nodes on either lateral side of the trachea and uh, pretracheal nodes inferior to the thyroid gland. The lateral compartments of the neck are classified as uh, levels one through five. And if you are not familiar with these levels, I refer you to a publication by Robbins et al. on, on the updated classification of the neck. Actually, I list the uh, reference here for your information. But uh, there are numerous publications, but uh, it's often still not standardized in the terminology of describing lymph nodes by radiologists. So if a node is present in the lateral neck, it behooves us to know in what compartment it resides in order to best plan our surgical procedure. Level one is the submandibular triangle compartment. Levels two, three, and four are the superior middle and inferior jugular chains. And level five is the posterior triangle but these compartments are further subdivided, as shown on the, um, on the diagram here. Now, using ultrasonography, the traditional boundaries for these compartments are not as easily visualized. So the boundary between level four and three by cross-sectional imaging is the cricoid cartilage, but this isn't as easily seen by ultrasonography, and therefore the omohyoid muscle where it crosses over the internal jugular vein is used as the boundary between these compartments. Similarly, between levels three and two, the hyoid bone is the traditional landmark for this delineation, and in ultrasonography, the carotid bifurcation is a surrogate marker for the boundary between levels three and two. And this is helpful in labeling lymph nodes within their respective compartment. So there's no proscriptive sequence of performing an ultrasound exam. If one performs ultrasonography oneself, it, it is just helpful to have an algorithm or a, a consistent approach to uh, doing things in a sequence that you won't forget anything and that you will um, cover all the territory. So my preference is to examine the thyroid and the central compartment first. And within the central neck, not only the nodes that might be inferior to the thyroid, but also those that are superior to the thyroid in the prelaryngeal space and even uh, up to the hyoid bone. And I, I take advantage of this opportunity to examine the larynx as well and assess for uh, mobility of the vocal folds with the awake patient. It only takes a few extra seconds and is not always successful, but it, it wastes very little time making the effort. And uh, furthermore, ex assessing for uh, congenital remnants such as thyroglossal duct cysts or even lingual thyroid, so going all the way up to the base of the tongue. And then I proceed to the lateral compartments, and my preference is to proceed from inferior to superior, from level four to three to two. I find it's easier to follow the common carotid artery superiorly and see it bifurcate and better recognize structures that are not vascular structures in level two by following the carotid up. Other sonographers will start from the top and go down, and there's really no right or wrong, but uh, again, just consistency is the rule. Then I proceed to the lateral neck further posteriorly, and level five is a pretty wide compartment, so it does require some sweeping back and forth, uh, and I'll show this with videos in just a moment. Finally, level one is the submandibular triangle that contains the submandibular gland, and for the purpose of thyroid cancer, this is a compartment that's not often involved by thyroid uh, metastatic nodes, but can be appropriate to inspect in given situations. Most scanning is done in the transverse plane, but the sagittal plane is used to corroborate or interrogate, and likewise Doppler is used liberally to inter interrogate lymph nodes. Uh, 
and to distinguish vascular structures from nodal structures. Finally, saving still images and video clips is helpful and tailoring the documentation and the report to the situation and uh, trying to standardize communication. So here's the uh, diagram of the central neck from the hyoid bone to the innominate artery. And uh, I find it easiest to assess the thyroid and then assess the paratracheal nodes, then the prelaryngeal and pretracheal nodes, and then moving superiorly to the larynx and on up to the hyoid bone in the region of any potential thyroglossal duct remnant and uh, lingual thyroid. In the process, you can also recognize pyramidal lobe uh, tissue in, in many instances. So this is a video of the central neck on the right side descending through the thyroid. You see the carotid just lateral to the thyroid and it descends to where it merges with the subclavian artery and becomes the anonymous artery there. So you'll recognize paratracheal nodes and pathology inferior to the thyroid. If we go to the next side, on the left, descending from the level of the, uh, the top of the larynx, the top of the thyroid, descending through the thyroid gland, here's the esophagus coming into view, and then inferior to the thyroid, you'll often see thymic tissue, especially in young patients. But nodal disease will pop into and out of view as you sweep over this area. So the dynamic view is, is really critical to recognizing nodal structures. Finally, this is a pathologic exam with descending through the left thyroid. There's tumor on the right, but as you see, you'll see hypoechoic nodules in the left and pretracheal region. And these, and here's the thymus in a young patient, so that is not tumor at the bottom there, but that's, a, that's thymus gland. But uh, again, the motion itself helps to um, catch one's eye and recognize these structures, and then they can be scrutinized and uh, measured and documented in still images. Coming down the midline from the isthmus of the thyroid down to the innominate artery, again, pretracheal nodes will come into view here. And then ascending from the thyroid superiorly through the cricoid here, through the cricothyroid space, up to the larynx. And at the level of the larynx, it helps to adjust one's settings and lower the frequency of the transducer to allow visualization of the vocal folds. <coughs> It's easy to just ask the patient to stop breathing momentarily and then tell them to resume breathing and uh, then continue sweeping on superiorly and um, through the hyoid and the base of tongue. Lateral neck levels four, three, and two, and then levels five and one. And here's a sweeping through the right lateral neck from inferior to superior with the carotid sheath and uh, carotid artery and jugular vein central in the, in the image here, and uh, <coughs> observing lymph nodes that are in the uh, circumferential region of the, uh, especially the jugular vein. Here's just an example, I'm sorry, here's an example with, uh, if we could play the video, with lymph node metastases, you'll see them just sort of pop into and out of view, and then you can subsequently stop and take still images and measure them. But the moving video is very helpful for initial assessment. And uh, then uh, posterior neck, a wide region with the trapezius muscle at the left side of the screen at the posterior border of the compartment. The uh, transverse processes of the spine are noted in the deep aspect of the image as you sweep up uh, over the spine. And level one with the submandibular gland moving inferiorly and then superiorly up to the mandible if you are assessing the salivary glands or level one. So I'm running out of time, so I'll just say that ultrasound should be considered as the first line imaging modality for cervical lymph node masses, uh, cervical lymph nodes and masses, but it, uh, it, it, does, it can be complementary to cross-sectional imaging, which you'll hear more about in just a few minutes. Uh, the quality of uh, imaging and detail of the nodal contents is best with ultrasonography. The cost is the least and the safety involves no radiation exposure. So these should be considered when uh, approaching the patient for lymphatic mapping and uh, ultrasound can be combined with fine needle aspiration biopsy as needed. So thanks very much. So you heard then the, the kind of comprehensive orderly sequence for nodal mapping now Dr. Levine will talk about the lesions, the lesional assessment. How do you know it's a bad node and how do you go about choosing something for biopsy?
So I'm going to talk about using ultrasound in lymph node analysis, and we've heard a lot this morning about low-risk cancer. And I'd like to start by just pointing out that if we go back to the dark ages prior to the 2009 guidelines, we knew that you could separate a high-risk from a low-risk patient on one thing and one thing only. It was the presence of lymph nodes. <clears throat> so before 2009, if a patient had no lymph nodes, they got no radioiodine. They had lymph nodes, they had radioiodine. This was based on this uh, data out of the Mayo Clinic, that if a patient had lymph nodes present, there was about a 15 to 20 percent risk of recurrence. If they did not have lymph nodes present at the time of initial surgery, that was a 1 to 3 percent risk. Not much different than what we know now, except when the 2009 guidelines came along, they separated now to three categories, low risk, intermediate, and high. And I've highlighted that the cervical lymph node metastases was the criteria from lymph nodes that brought you from low risk now to intermediate risk. When these 2009 guidelines were modified into the 2015, we started finding a lot more uh, reference to lymph nodes, and as we can see, there are, I've listed si uh, six of them here. There's actually a seventh down below. But the presence of lymph nodes suddenly changed. It was how many, how big. If, a lymph node, if all the lymph nodes were under two millimeters, that kept it in low risk. If the lymph node even had extra nodal extension, but only one, it stayed in low risk. As you moved up and you started to see less than five lymph nodes, stayed low risk. You move above five lymph nodes, you start to get now to a more intermediate risk and all the way up until we see clinical disease where you can actually palpate the lymph node or we get into lymph nodes greater than three centimeters and now that's going to move us up into that intermediate into high risk. So we can see that we get a lot of information based on that pre-op lymph node screen. So the guidelines came out and first recommended that when anyone is getting a thyroid ultrasound, because of the presence of a nodule, picked up however, palpation, uh, incidental finding, that at that time you should do a lymph node examination, comprehensive neck exam, not just the thyroid exam. And there's a slight discrepancy in these initial guidelines. So here with recommendation six, we're told that if you see a lymph node that looks suspicious, you should biopsy it possibly with thyroglobulin, that's a whole different topic, but you should biopsy that lymph node if it will change your approach to surgery. Well, certainly it will change your approach to surgery. If the patient has lateral lymph nodes present, you're going to it now indicate, there's an indication to do a central neck dissection and the lateral neck dissection as well. The next guideline had to do with after the biopsy showed that the patient had thyroid cancer, we now do a preoperative comprehensive neck ultrasound for the lymph node mapping and staging on that. And in this, we're told that if the lymph node is greater than 8 to 10 millimeters in size, now we should be biopsying the lymph node. So there's a little discrepancy that if we see any lymph node when we're doing the, bio the ultrasound prior to biopsy, we're going to biopsy it. But if we don't, if we know there's cancer there, we're going to ignore smaller nodes. And I'll come back to that in a little bit because I, I, I consider that a, an issue. So I'll show you a few pictures of lymph nodes and we'll talk about what within the lymph nodes makes it more or less suspicious. So a benign lymph node is basically flattened or oval in shape. It has a long axis. It looks either like a lima bean or a string bean. And that short to long axis should be less than 0.5, or the long to short, less than, uh, greater than two to, two to one. In our original issues of the thyroid ultrasound textbook that Baskin Duick and myself put out, it said that had to be in a transverse view. But when I went back and looked up the original studies, that's any view. You want the longest axis and then find orthogonal to it the shortest axis, and that's where you're going to get your two to one. The echogenic hyalur line we'll talk about in a, in a moment, but that's a very reassuring finding. The vascular flow should be limited to the hilum or the center of the lymph node on Doppler. The size is not that important. And then finally, border characteristics are also less important. So let's look at a couple benign lymph nodes. Here we have lymph nodes that are clearly more than two to one in the long to short axis. 
They're shaped like hot dogs, not hamburgers, as uh, Diana Dean likes to say from the Mayo. And, um, the, but on these lymph nodes, we're not seeing the hyalur line. The absence of the hyalur line is not a concerning feature. Here we see some more benign lymph nodes. Again, we have uh, the very thick, broad central hilum on these. The hilum will, here can be uh, central, it can be eccentric, it can be thin, or it can be thick. The blood flow in the bottom uh, panel shows you that it's limited just to that central hilum, and we'll see some examples of the, the opposite. So the hilar line is that the lymph node itself can be split down the middle like a bean, and that hilum contains both fat and the blood vessels coursing through it. So a normal hilar line, as I said, can have any th thickness, and it can be either central or diagonal. The presence of that hyalur line is very reassuring, but its absence is not considered a suspicious finding. So here we see a few more lymph nodes, and I use this as an example where the top panel is showing you a, a transverse view, and you'd say, gee, that's a rounded lymph node, but on the bottom, when we get to the long to short axis, um, it, it's... Uh, Use your pointer and you can oh, shoot. Okay. Uh, they can only sit on one side. So then the characteristics of metastatic lymph nodes include uh, microcalcifications, cystic necrosis, chaotic vascularization or peripheral vascularization, that rounded appearance with a short to long axis greater than 0 0.5, and jugular displacement and the absence of the hyalur line. So here are a couple examples. Here we have a uh, clearly abnormal lymph node. It's showing us microcalcifications. It has cystic necrosis. We see that there is posterior acoustic enhancement because of the cystic content of the lymph node. Um, there's no question looking at this lymph node that it's highly suspicious. Similarly with this one, we're seeing all of those characteristics. It's rounded in both views. It's long to short axis still is rounded. It has calcification and it has some degree of cystic necrosis, and again, the posterior acoustic enhancement. This lymph node actually has a two to one ratio in its long to short axis, but it's a very atypical appearing lymph node, and when we look at that vascularity, it's disordered, it's peripheral, it's not running in a, in a straight line down the center of the node. Here, this one, um, Bob Sofferman liked to talk about the wagon wheel look to a lymph node if it had lots of peripheral areas of uh, cystic necrosis within it. So this one's showing the vascularity towards the center, but it has a very characteristic appearance with that wagon wheel look to it. And then here we see a four centimeter <coughs> lymph node. This is a palpable one. This is a patient with clinically apparent disease um, and just since we rarely see them this big, I thought I'd throw one in. It's got the cystic necrosis and it has calcification within it. I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to play the video of jugular displacement, but with very light pressure, if you can't get the jugular to totally fill, um, it should be considered suspicious. And this lymph node compressing the, the jugular vein uh, sitting here, and you can see it compressed behind this lymph node, which actually has a central hilum, uh, and then the carotid over here. So if we look at what the sensitivity and specificity of each of these findings is, um, we, we find that the two most important are the calcification and the cystic necrosis. As you can see along here, they approach 100%, depending on the study, for both microcalcifications and cystic necrosis. The peripheral vascularity um, has a good balance between high sensitivity and high specificity, although neither being all the way up to that 90 to 100 percent. And I was always convinced that the uh, peripheral vascularity or chaotic vascularity was the most important until I had a few patients with reactive lymph nodes that were very atypical in their vascularity, biopsied them, they were benign, and they, as they shrunk down when the reactive nature disappeared, the vascularity normalized. Um, we can see that the uh, hyperechogenicity, and here we're talking about hyperechogenicity that is not just part of the central hilum, that that's considered a, a suspicious feature, also getting up there, but not quite as sensitive and specific. And the round shape, not as good, but something that we still will consider. So putting that together, in the guidelines, the 2015 guidelines, they said for a lymph node greater than seven millimeters, if you see 
calcification or cystic necrosis, consider it a malignant lymph node. That, that should be a given if you see those highly suspicious. If you have, they, they comment that the balance between sensitivity and specificity is good for the vascularity, but that the rounded shape itself and the, the abnormal uh, structure of it should not in itself be reason to do a biopsy alone. You want to add all these things together, and then at the bottom, the interpretation of the ultrasound needs to incorporate all of the clinical and other factors in it. There are several things that we know are prognostic indicators for recurrence that are nodal in origin that we have to think about. So those, as we've talked about, a lymph node metastasis larger than three centimeters, extranodal extension, particularly when it is in multiple lymph nodes, more than five lymph nodes involved. If the patient has an aggressive subtype of cancer on the biopsy, if we see tall cell or if we know that there's a tert mutation, the lymph nodes are much more aggressive. And finally, if we're looking after the surgery, a high ratio of positive to removed lymph nodes. We would like to have a lot more benign lymph nodes removed at the time of the lymph node resection. If someone gives you four out of five positive nodes, it's concerning that there will be nodes retained that are positive. If you get four out of 25, it's more likely that they have cleaned out the area around those involved nodes and left you with, with more of a clean bed. So the guidelines then, if we come back to the, the, the guidelines for biopsy on the pre-op ultrasound, again, if it's 8 to 10 millimeters or larger and looks suspicious, you should biopsy it according to this, or consider biopsy. And those less than 8 to 10 can be watched in this setting. Now, while I agree 100 percent with this as a recommendation for a post-op evaluation and recurrence, and, and we'll talk about this, I think, during the rest of the, the series here, why we are going to ignore some of the smaller lymph nodes after surgery and not go in after every one. I'm a little concerned when that recommendation is for pre-op. So here we have a, a clearly malignant looking lymph node, but it's less than 0 0.7 centimeters, and the guidelines would not have us biopsying this. So in the proper clinical, context, I would certainly want that lymph node uh, assessed before surgery. This would make a huge difference in the patient's outcome. Similarly, this case here is one that Greg and I recently shared, and this is a, a young woman, a teenager, and she had uh, what looked like diffuse sclerosing papillary carcinoma within her thyroid, and then she had this one abnormal appearing lymph node. And I'll, I'll go on to the next slide because I show that in a few other views. And what's interesting about this lymph node is that it does have a normal 2 to 1, greater than 2 to 1 ratio. It's less than that, uh, it's only 6 millimeters or so in the, uh, in the short axis. There's a clear central hilum running along here, and the vascularity is limited to that hilum, but then there's this one spot of hyperechogenicity within that. So I looked at this node in the context of a patient with probable diffuse sclerosing and said it would be absolutely wrong to not biopsy this prior to surgery, biopsy it positive, and at surgery she had multiple positive lymph nodes that we did not see at, at the time of the ultrasound. So just to conclude, I want to point out that the pre-op neck ultrasound is not just looking for lymph nodes. We're going to really evaluate whether we're at high risk or low risk disease. So it's going to be the size of the index lesion, multifocality, whether we can pick up extrathyroidal extension, uh, the location of the cancer, whether it is in a favorable or an unfavorable location for higher or lower risk of metastasis. Thank you. Can I get my slides up? So to finish out this assessment phase, this imaging phase, you know, the ATA says it's clinically apparent nodes that are the ones that are important, then we should be able to obtain this by paying attention with ultrasound and other radiographs preoperatively to make a map that should be inclusive. So there are some patients like this CAT scan, which we see all the time, frankly, depending on your practice. Now, I realize if your practice is smaller cancers and uh, some benign disease, you, then you think, CAT scan, why would I ever use that? That's insane. But if you see a lot of advanced cancer, then you think CAT scan all the time. 
So uh, this is one of such of a patient um, that uh, axial imaging is appropriate. I use it more or less routinely because I never know exactly where that nodal disease is, but I admit that it is probably some subset of patients on Lisa's and, and Bob's screening ultrasound that can be determined as optimal candidates for uh, axial CT scanning. So in what patients might be best. So the ATA has kind of been a pendulum swinging back and forth, and in 2009 they said you mustn't even think the word CAT scan, you mustn't think iodinized contrast, you're putting our radioactive iodine, which is given on non-evidence-based data out of convenience, because that's the way it was done yesterday by endocrinologists. Excuse me, Mike, for saying that, but there, there isn't any real data suggesting it must be given the moment the scalpel is withdrawn from the neck. It's okay to have a little bit of a delay. Perhaps it isn't even given in some patients. So the timing of it, not that it shouldn't be given, but the timing of it is something we've been weaned on the idea that it must be given immediately, and perhaps we have enough time for the month or two that it takes to excrete the iodine. Um, and so the ATA guidelines have kind of swung back in the direction so that certainly, as Lisa mentioned, 32 preoperative ultrasound of thyroid and neck first test screening test for sure. And the, Lisa has gone over and, and Bob has the, the uh, reason why we want that because the lesional information on ultrasound is tremendously strategic, is better than CAT scanning, the lesional information not necessarily the localizing information, and a surgeon needs both of those things. We need to know it's a target. We need to know where it is adjacent to the rest of the viscera that we're rubbing up against every day, all, all week long. So it's about a nodal map, and in some circumstances, these are the regions that uh, Lisa talked about, and in some circumstances, uh, this nodal map may be CAT scan based, uh, ultrasound based, or in some cases, just ultrasound based. Uh, but this is very important for surgeons to, to do pre-op prior to surgery. It, it can be shared with the patient. It can be discussed. It can be discussed with the endocrinologist. We can jointly, as Bob and I do, discuss is this a target? Isn't it a target? Do we need to include the lateral neck? Don't we? So as a team, we approach the patient with one unified primary and nodal treatment algorithm, surgery, and, and then if there's a recurrence in that dissect, neck that we didn't dissect, we can both relook at the x-rays and share our map and sort out where did we go wrong, but we can be in agreement. So the idea is that the ATA has kind of in its nodal recommendations has evolved this concept of microscopic disease. You can't see it radiographically. It's not important to remove macroscopic or clinically apparent disease, that which you can feel or see on ultrasound or see on CAT scan or see grossly at surgery is a surgical target. And so we're really talking about trying to make a map based on ultrasound and CT scan to map that out preoperatively and then dissect those compartments where it occurs and leave those compartments where it's absent alone. So we're talking about a third of patients with papillary carcinoma, depending on their age, have clinically apparent nodal disease, a third of patients. So we're talking either you can palpate it, you can see it on x-rays, or you grossly see it abnormal at surgery, a third of patients with papillary carcinoma uh, have this disease, which is uh, most agree a surgical target. That which is microscopically evident, not clinically apparent, much more common. These nine studies, up to 80% of patients, if you prophylactically dissect a given component of the neck, central or lateral, harbor small foci of papillary carcinoma. What is that disease? We're talking about nodes that have foci of disease that range between two and five millimeter focus of disease within a node. It's a normal looking node at surgery. It's a normal node basically at preoperative ultrasound. So macrometastasis, that which is clinically apparent in about a third of patients, micrometastasis is much more common up to 80%. So in this conversation about low risk thyroid disease, overall low risk primary disease, we, can we have a discussion about low-risk nodes? That's really what we're talking about. And actually, Mike's observational data for primaries, we have 
30, 40 years of observation of micrometastasis. Before the prophylactic nectar section bell was rung, we sat on all those nodes and they behaved themselves. So at least in nodal format, we have a tremendous experience in, nodal, in microscopic papillary carcinoma observation, at least in nodal format. So just like not all the animals are the same, uh, you know, uh, but uh, not all the uh, nodes are created equal, and so this has been looked at and refer repeated here several times, but if you just follow me here with this two slides, one is the first circle is that which is clinically negative. X-ray, your physical exam is clinically negative and not prophylactically dissected. And then the second circle, that which is clinically N0, but for whatever reason, prophylactically dissected and found to be microscopically positive. And then the third circle, that which is a big bad node that everybody sees preoperatively and is therapeutically dissected. Let's look at, you know, what's the reason you don't want to have a node in your neck for papillary in the first place? In most populations, it isn't a su survival decrement, unless elderly populations perhaps, but it's primarily because nodes beget nodes and there will be recurrent nodes in those patients that harbor nodes at presentation. That's the prognostic step off. So what is the rate of nodal recurrence in these three groups? They are more or less just as Doug Ross said this morning, microscopic nodal disease, whether you surgically remove it or don't, the nodal recurrence is quite similar. There may be a percentage point one way or another. Macroscopic nodal disease, therapeutically dissected nodal recurrence is over 20 percent, at least historically in the literature based on these studies, which I think are the best in the literature looking at this issue. So prophylactic dissection, the identification of microscopic nodal disease, although it's frequently there, doesn't really get you much benefit, much bang for the buck. It's a pyrrhic victory. So clinically apparent nodal disease, physical exam positive, radiographically positive, clearly abnormal at surgery. That's what you want to target surgically. You want to make the nodal map preoperatively. And so what I do is I try and figure out where are the black dots. That is that something that me and the endocrinologist together feel is abnormal. And then those compartments I dissect and the compartments that don't have any black dots in them aren't dissected. I don't care whether the patient has BRAF positivity and is at risk for this or they're at risk for that. I want to know, do they in fact have nodal disease in that given compartment? If they do, I'll operate on that full compartment and if they don't, I won't. And this has been a helpful uh, paradigm shift for me in management. So how can CAT scans be helpful? 2009, you must never get a CAT scan. And 2015, CAT scans have utility. Why do they have utility? Because when disease is bad, extent of disease needs to take into account the cervical viscera that the thyroid is in, it, it, is it, the milieu that the thyroid exists in. So invasive primaries or very advanced nodal disease. It's extent of disease. You know, if you had a 70-year-old male with an invasive disease into the cricoid cartilage fixed to the larynx, what would be the very first test you'd get? A CAT scan to figure out how much of the cricoid cartilage has to come out. With bulky nodal disease, it's the same issue. What is the extent of disease, which axial scanning can be additive to uh, in terms of uh, the initial ultrasound screening? And so this just the data that, that in certain circumstances, and I think we're still evolving what subgroup of patients have bad invasive primary disease or bulky nodal disease. What are the exact definitions? Who would most benefit from this added axial scanning step after ultrasound? Some surgeons say, well, you know, I am very good at what I do, and I can palpate around and figure out what's going on. And if you look at the data, and I'm sure that's the case for all the surgeons in the room, but if you look at the data, it is not such great sensitivity and specificity, this tool here, feeling around. Also, the sensitivity in the lateral neck is a little hard to get if you're only in the central neck. So we're not so good with our fingers as we think. And actually, Mark Erkin has, has shown a study that whether you're a junior surgeon or a senior surgeon, you're not really so great at being able to palpate uh, disease. Uh, we've looked at the utility of CAT scanning and ultrasound together, and I just want to show a couple of instructive points. We looked at ultrasound alone, CAT scan alone, and then CAT scan and ultrasound together, and you see that the sensitivity of ultrasound and CAT scan in primary thyroid disease with the thyroid present is both quite good, but the, in the lateral neck, as you would expect, but both together are better than either one. So they see different nodes, 
And then also in the central neck, as you know, sensitivity of ultrasound in the central neck, that is with the thyroid in place, is limited. Uh, most studies, 10%, 30%, somewhere in that range. CAT scan, 50%, and both together better than either one separately. And also, of note, palpation for central neck nodal disease is a worthless endeavor. This is all about x-rays. It isn't about physical exam. We found 26% of our patients had compartments identified with macroscopic disease that ultrasound had not identified. Uh, and so the, in that subset of pa again, biased by my patient practice, but in my patient volume, uh, this was a very helpful additional step to make that map. So. Uh, ultrasound is, I mean, uh, CAT scan has utility in either bad primary or bad nodal disease. So bad primary, you get something stuck to the larynx, you want to know how stuck is it. If you get something, you want to know how much cartilage do I, can I can tell the patient I'm going to get. If you have bad nodal disease, nodal disease like this, you want to sort out exactly where that is. Does it go down between the common carotid subclavian bifurcation just below the clavicle? You can easily go there if you know it's there. You don't want to go there generally if you know it isn't there. You don't want to go behind the left jugular vein either in the left neck unless there's a node sitting right there, in which case you talk to the patient about Kyle leak and a longer hospitalization and being NPO and medium trained triglycerides. You want that information to be able to articulate exactly what's going to happen to that patient. So we're talking about bulky nodal disease. And we're talking about central neck nodal disease that is low, sh hidden by either the thyroid or the sternum or the clavicle, and it can be mapped out very nicely with CAT scanning. One month is sufficient, although every endocrinologist is a little different, so you need to, the surgeons need to articulate this need preoperatively so that the endocrinologists know exactly what was done. So in my practice, when I send a patient back to an endocrinologist, I try and send two pieces of paper with them. One is the PATH report, and the second is the CAT scan report, which documents the nodal disease with the date circled, so that they know I don't want to stumble on myself. I want to give radioactive iodine if it's necessary at the exact correct time, whether that's urinary iodide at three months or whether it's two months or one month, whatever it is, they can decide what, what's optimal for them. What about recurrent nodes? And this has already been mentioned by uh, uh, Bob, and I won't get into it again, except to say that Mike and I actually wrote this specific thing, and we talked a long time about should we say eight or 10 millimeters because we realized that's going to be a problem if we say 8 or 10 millimeters, if we're that granular. But we did have a very long list of reasons why the 8 to 10 millimeter may not necessarily be operated on. So if the 8 to 10 millimeter is on an only functioning nerve, then maybe you want to take pause. If it's in the setting of someone with a progressively growing brain metastasis, then you want to think, hey, maybe we can sit on this eight millimeter node. So there are very significant local, regional, and systemic uh, factors that would be taken into it. But eight to 10 millimeters can generally, with an accurate ultrasound and CAT scan map, be mapped out and identified and surgically targeted. So it's permissive to surgery, but it doesn't mandate surgery. So that's for CT scan for advanced nodes. I want to thank you for your attention and then want to move on. Now we've finished with the where are they. Now we're what do we do about them, the more difficult topics. And because it's a more difficult topic, we gave that to Jerry Dougherty, who uh, will be able to talk about the central neck. And I didn't, I wasn't overly prescriptive. He can talk about prophylactic, therapeutic, both, neither, but how to and when you do it. This is a big nasty uh, thing, so you have to point at least one slide if you want. You can't get both, so I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you, Greg, for the invitation. Congratulations on such a successful conference. Um, the, the topic I was asked to address is, is a central neck dissection. When do you do the central neck? I think it may have been better um, titled, When Do I Do the Central Neck? Uh, we, we've heard in, in the... Um, lunchtime conference today where we discussed central neck dissection with four expert panelists that there are a lot of different views or, or a lot of different stances regarding the management of the central neck uh, and I think people generally kind of separate into the opt-in versus the opt-out approach. Um, some people always do the central neck except when they don't and some people never do it <laughs> except when they do. 
Um, so I'll try and give you my, my view on how that can be pulled together. So we've seen a bunch of uh, views of the central neck and defined the, the level six lymph nodes. I think that is, uh, uh, you've all got that down now. I think the key points for me is, first of all, there is no controversy about the use of uh, the value of therapeutic central neck dissection um, in patients who have demonstrated abnormal lymph nodes in the central neck. So everybody agrees on that. I think prophylactic central neck node dissection can be useful um, in light of some patient characteristics. Either they have higher risk of having uh, lymph nodes there or higher risk of recurrence or, or in ill effects of their disease, or if there is a potential impact on the treatment strategy of knowing what the central neck node's uh, status is. Um, and I'll go in a little bit of detail on that. I think minimizing the complications of a central neck dissection are, are key to this whole balance, um, and Jeff Thompson is going to tell us in a moment how to do this well. So the ATA guidelines um, include uh, information on the therapeutic central neck dissection in, in item A. Item B is the prophylactic central neck dissection, and C is basically giving permission for either the opt-in or the opt-out. In B, you can do the opt-out. You know, you, you, there are reasons why we can do this. Um, oops, I'm sorry, didn't mean to go ahead quite so fast. Um, there are reasons why we can do this, especially if the patient has more advanced disease, advanced primary tumors, uh, T3 or T4, if they have clinically involved nodes, or if they have lateral um, nodes that uh, would be dissected, we always want to include the central neck dissection for those patients. But finally, if the patient has a small tumor, appears to be limited to the thyroid, the central neck nodes uh, appear clinically normal, it is perfectly rational and reasonable um, to do a thyroidectomy without central node dissection. Um, there have been some analyses or attempts to, to gather the data um, around the, the effect of central neck central lymph node dissection. Um, this is a study from uh, uh, Julianne Sosa's group at Duke, uh, where they looked at the, the extant literature at that point um, regarding central neck dissection. And if you look just at the right-hand part of this uh, graph, you can see the, the equipoise line there in the middle. The summary is the large diamond near the bottom. It's almost significant that central neck dissection um, has an effect, but I would be a little bit critical of Julianne's work here, and I love Julianne. I think that she's done the best she can do with very muddy data, um, and knowing some of the data that is in these papers, having contributed to the data that's in some of these trials, uh, there, there's a lot of noise in here, and the fact that it came out, you know, close to being beneficial, I think may just be, be evidence of that noise. Um, and I would say this is, these are data from one of those studies um, that shows that there was, uh, we we're trying to look at the difference between total thyroidectomy alone in the, the second column from the left there versus total thyroidectomy and bilateral central neck dissection uh, in the third column. Um, but if you look at the bottom row, you'll see that the patients who got central neck dissections ended up in our system at the University of Michigan at the time getting much more radioactive iodine. So we didn't compare central neck dissection versus no central neck dissection. We compared that plus less iodine versus more iodine. And, and the fact that this came out with no difference in the patient outcome, um, it doesn't really tell us what we thought we were trying to look at in the trial. And I think all of these trials that Julianne's summary pulls together have this kind of problem. So I would contend that we don't really know whether central neck dissection has a therapeutic benefit or not. The only thing we can say is that it might be useful in helping us make good decisions in some patients. Part of the reason that my um, attitude towards central neck dissection has changed over the last decade or so is this, uh, what's called the Will Rogers phenomenon. So many of you in the room, uh, like me, will remember who Will Rogers was. He was an American humorist to uh, worked in a lot of different uh, genres. He uh, did vaudeville. He was on in silent movies. He was on TV. And he had this quote, when the Okies left Oklahoma and moved to California, they raised the average intelligence levels in both states. 
And uh, a guy named Alvin Feinstein at Yale repurposed this in the 80s in an article in the New, New England Journal. And he, he coined the Will Rogers phenomenon to, to represent upstaging of cancers by additional testing. So at the time, CT scans were relatively new and were just becoming into more common use. And he um, demonstrated that by doing additional imaging tests and moving, for example, the worst prognostic patients in stage two to stage three by additional imaging, we made them, we improved the, the status of both groups without ever affecting any individual patient's outcome. Uh, and I think we did this in thyroid cancer as well. Uh, we moved a bunch of people from stage one to stage three by doing prophylactic central neck dissections. I don't think we def necessarily made anybody better. Um, we probably got a lot of people more radioiodine than, than may have helped them. Um, and so I think we have to be very careful both what information we seek and what we do with the information once we have it. So I've become much more conservative on this, thanks to Will Rogers. Mm -hmm. Um, finally, I think we, we have to look at how that central neck dissection ties into the radioiodine use. And this is a, the, the summary table from the ATA guidelines on the, the utility of radioiodine. Uh, it, the, along the left-hand column from top to bottom, we go from low risk to high risk patient situations. And on the right-hand column, uh, uh, quote whether the, the radioiodine is indicated to be used. There's some clarity at the extremes. So we know for very low risk patients, radioiodine isn't helpful. We think for very high risk patients, radioiodine may be useful. But there's a, a lot of ground in the middle there. Um, and it, in that ground, I think we really have to work together as uh, disease management teams for our patients with thyroid cancer to understand what information we want, how we're going to get it, and how we're going to use it once we have it. So my current approach um, to the lymph nodes and, and thyroid cancer, I think lymph nodes are important. They tell us something about the biology of the disease. The size and numbers are, are important. Um, and I think that central neck dissection can be helpful in specific situations to define the disease and, and to help guide the management. I use it mainly now in patients who appear to possibly be in a higher risk category in the T3 or T4 scenarios where knowing what the central neck uh, nodes uh, effect is may help to shape their further treatment. And I think this is a repeat of the, the first slide. So I think I'll close there and, and uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Jim. So with that uh, advice, we'll now have uh, Jeff Thompson tell us about some of the technical aspects from his perspective on central neck. This is a big, nasty point. Greg, thank you, and I'd also like to thank the steering committee for inviting me to participate in this uh, Congress. It looks like uh, an outstanding meeting. Um, I'm going to say, reiterate a few things and, and then talk about some tips that I use when I do a central node dissection. Up until a few years ago, it was very easy for, for myself and some of my colleagues at Mayo to decide what to do as far as the central neck. If a patient had a diagnosis of papillary thyroid carcinoma, either preoperatively or intraoperatively, they got a total or near total thyroidectomy and they got a bilateral uh, central node dissection. And we showed with a great number of patients that over half those patients would have uh, metastases. Many of those were micrometastases. Um, but, uh, and, and the, we had very low morbidity associated with that, and the overall recurrence rate, at least out of, of five years, seemed to be uh, excellent. So we had a very aggressive approach to this. But I think uh, we and others have kind of looked at the data that's out there now, and perhaps we've been a, a little overly too aggressive with central node dissection. And we certainly know that individuals that don't do this operation very often but still may treat pa uh, papillary thyroid cancer can get into trouble uh, doing a central node dissection. So the central nodes, so we, we've already heard, they're the most commonly involved lymph nodes in patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. 
And just in terms of the classification, we've had reference to this already, but uh, CN0 nodes, these are nodal metastases not detected either clinically or by imaging either preoperatively or intraoperatively. And then there are the CN1A nodes. These are central node metastases that can be detected clinically or by imaging preoperatively or intraoperatively. And this, we've heard a lot already about the 2015 ATA guidelines. I, I think they're very good guidelines, but they're just that. They're guidelines. It doesn't mean that you need to follow everything. And there's some things that still bother me about the guidelines, uh, and I'll, I'll mention that. As far as uh, the recommendations in the ATA guidelines, just again to reiterate, Therapeutic level six dissection, in other words, these are CN1A nodes, should accompany total thyroidectomy. I think we all agree with that. That's a strong recommendation. As far as uh, therapeutic uh, lymph node dissection, uh, that should be performed for biopsy proven disease. And as far as prophylactic central neck dissection, either ipsilateral or bilateral, it should be considered in patients with PTC and CN0 nodes that are T3, T4 tumors or that have not necessarily uh, obvious central nodes but have positive lateral nodes or if the information will be used to plan further therapy. In addition, thyroidectomy without prophylactic central node dissection may be appropriate for smaller tumors, T1 and T2. T2, as you know, goes up to a, a four centimeter tumor. I personally still have difficulty with that. And frankly, with anybody with a tumor one and a half to two centimeters, uh, will get uh, at least a unilateral uh, central node dissection in my hands. And, uh, Greg and, and, and Jerry and I were involved in this consensus statement as far as the definition of the central neck dissection. And just a couple of definitions before I show you some pictures. Um, the central neck dissection should be a comprehensive, compartment-oriented removal of prelaryngeal or Delphian lymph nodes and the pretracheal lymph nodes and at least one paratracheal nodal basin, either right or left or bilateral. Node plucking or berry picking is unacceptable. We still see patients referred into us that have had that kind of node uh, assessment and surgery, and it's, it's in every, every study that you look at, it's associated with a higher recurrence rate. And the lymphoreolar tissue that I refer to, uh, anterior and posterior to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, should be removed on one or both sides. And I think that's very important. You can't, I, I don't think you can feel uh, lymph nodes, when you're talking about a, a prophylactic central node dissection, unless you open up that envelope, expose the recurrent laryngeal nerve in front and in back, and look for those bluish black lymph nodes or enlarged lymph nodes that are not necessarily rock hard. In addition, if the frozen section in our, in our experience is positive on one side, we'll then go on to do the other side. So we do rely heavily on frozen section in our institution. And um, the dissection, the prophylactic dissection, can be uh, unilateral unless microscopic disease is found in multiple nodes, and usually we're talking more than five. And the therapeutic central neck dissection should be bilateral. And then there are extensions of the central node dissection that are described in the uh, study that I mentioned, uh, which might include comprehensive removal of retropharyngeal, retroesophageal, parapharyngeal, and superior mediastinal nodes. These are, are much less common. These are nodes that are better picked up by CT scan, and if you have extensive disease, uh, we too uh, recommend getting an IV contrast CT scan or an MRI. Now, uh, this is as far as the technical tips. Uh, one, one can uh, complete uh, the lobe on one side and remove that, or one can use that as a handle to pull the trachea over. Generally, I remove the lobe, let the pathologist uh, have a chance to take a look at that, particularly if we don't have a, a definitive diagnosis of papillary but a suspicious one. And I have my assistant hold over the trachea, which kind of puts the, the nerve uh, in full view. And uh, again, what's, as far as the boundaries, you can see that it's from the hyoid to the anominate and carotid to carotid. Sometimes there are, little, uh, there are pathologic lymph nodes that are poking their head out from underneath the carotid, and we include those as well. 
It's uh, very unusual to see uh, lymph nodes above the, the Delphian region, but it, it can occur. And in this next slide here, this is the, typically the first thing that we do. Uh, I open up that, what I call the anterior envelope, because I want to see the entire course of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, because you really you want to clean out what's anterior to the nerve, you want to clean out what's posterior to the nerve, and oftentimes uh, you can see positive nodes uh, posterior to the nerve when there's not something more anterior. And this is uh, basically just showing you here the, the metastatic lymph nodes along the nerve. Uh, you can also see the inferior parathyroid gland here, and it's very difficult, in my experience, to preserve the inferior parathyroid gland if you're going to do a good central node dissection. And typically, uh, if we see that that's going to be the case, we'll take that uh, parathyroid out early and auto-transplant it into this side opposite where the cancer is, into one of the strap muscles or the sternocleidomastoid. But it's critically important, again, that you, get, you see that plane of the nerve and that you clean out those nodes both anterior and posterior, especially when you're doing a therapeutic uh, node dissection. And ideally, this is what you like to see, but again, it's very difficult to preserve the inferior parathyroid gland. We work very hard to preserve the superior parathyroid gland, which is easier to do when you're going to do a central neck dissection. And even sometimes, if we're struggling preserving a superior gland, we leave a tiny little sliver of thyroid tissue on the contralateral side, on the normal side, associated with that superior parathyroid to try to save it but oftentimes the inferior glands get auto-transplanted. And this is what it should look like uh, when you're all finished. And again, you can see the entire course of the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerves. You can see the preserved superior parathyroid glands, and the inferior parathyroid glands have been removed and auto-transplanted. And we carry this dissection down to the uh, innominate artery. I think on that note, I'll stop and we'll go on from there. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get those uh, cases set up? Okay, great. All right, so before we move on to uh, this uh, case, I'd like to first just take a, a minute and ask if you have any questions on ultrasound for Lisa or uh, Bob, uh, any issues with when you do central neck dissection to Jerry, or uh, technical issues uh, relating to Jeff's Presentation. Any questions at all that anyone has now? Any of them, any of the panelists can answer any of those realms, not just those areas that they dissected. Yes, please go ahead. Gauri uh, Pantavaidya, I'm a head and neck surgeon from Tata Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, my question is regarding um, prophylactic central compartment dissection. Uh, 60 to 80 percent we see have micrometastasis. We don't do prophylactic central compartment dissections for early cancers. We're not giving them radioactive iodine. What happens to these micrometastases? Do we know the natural history in an era when we are not doing surgery or radioactive iodine? The Wong meta-analysis was when we gave radioactive iodine. So I, I can take a swing at that. I think we do know the natural history for these patients, especially um, for the younger patients with smaller tumors confined to the thyroid gland. Nothing happens to those metastases. Uh, you know, we've, we seem to keep learning this lesson over and over again um, in cycles. Uh, you know, the, we've, we've got historical data where we showed prophylactic neck, lateral neck dissections um, showed that same 60 to 80 percent of, of uh, patients had positive nodes. And if we don't dissect those, nothing happens. I think the same thing is happening in the central neck and as we move towards active surveillance for even small primary tumors, I, I think we're looking at the same indolent disease and a minority of patients with progressive disease. Yes, please. Uh, I'm John Saber from Austin, Texas. I'm curious about the approach to level five. It seems like we've gotten away from doing that as a standard dissection. If you have macroscopic disease in two, three, or four, and no evidence of disease in uh, zone five, what is the panel's uh, approach to that? Yeah, this is, so, so there's region, I mean, in the quote unquote lateral neck, there's a lot of regions that don't necessarily get included in the typical lateral neck, at least, that I offer. So region one, region two, potentially, depending on if you have a single lower region three node, and region five. Uh, 
how much do you do in a lateral neck? Does it depend on the exact pattern of disease you have initially, Jeff, or and then we'll take Lisa and and uh, and um, Jerry as well. Well, I, I think it does uh, matter. Uh, you know what what the pattern is. If I have a lot of nodal disease, for example, in level three. I'm going to go up higher into level two to try to get into an area where there's negative nodal disease. At least I feel better when I do that. And the same is true. I always, uh, when, I, when I dictate this, I always talk about the anterior part of level five. And I very frequently, when I'm doing two, three, and four, I'll reach back behind the sternocleidomastoid and take out a fair amount of tissue in level five just to make sure that, that we're around that. Because if you have positive nodes in three and four, you know, there could be something going on in level five that, and if you do that, at least my thought is that maybe it'll keep me from having to go back later on to level five. So Jeremy, uh, uh, Jerry, what, what do you do then? Uh, what, what constriction of the lateral neck do you permit and in what circumstances? So the most common sites for disease is levels three and four. Um, and I think the, at some point, people sort of put forward the idea that you would take out the compartment that was affected and then any compartment that touched it. So if you had level four disease, you'd do three, four, and five, and so on. My experience is you very rarely need to do five, uh, and part of that is because the um, ultrasound is so sensitive in level five. There's, there's not a lot of complexity back there, so I feel very comfortable if the ultrasound says there's nothing there, there, there generally is nothing there. Um, so if there's disease at levels three and four, I'll usually do the, the 2A, um, so not go all the way above um, the, the uh, spinal accessory to, in, in level two. And, and it may even be the bottom of 2A um, down through levels three and four. I'm much more concerned about getting the bottom of level four than I am about these things that are up high because the recurrences that we see are at the, you know, at the very bottom of level four, do we leave a lymph node there? Are there lymph nodes behind the carotid artery and kind of that no man's land between uh, four and six? I think we, we need to concentrate our efforts where the disease is. Lisa, what would you say? Do you, I will, I don't use frozen section very often and I know Mayo Clinic is very focused and skilled and has a very elaborate frozen lab. I will occasionally use frozen in two nodal situations, if I know I'm dealing with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and there are some ghost-like nodes and I think they look like Hashimoto's, I may frozen a few of them. I'm still compelled to take those that are out in the surgical field, but I tone down my nodal aggression if I know that I've frozen a couple of nodes that are negative with Hashimoto's. Also, I, my, the upper limit of my lateral neck dissection sometimes will be uh, phrased out by a, a frozen negative node above the positive node and I'll work from there back. You can have skip metastasis, maybe it's a false sense of security, but how do you scale back from a lateral neck or do you never scale back? Yeah, I, I find using frozen section at the top of level two, I, t I routinely do 2A, 3, 4, and 5B and uh, the traditional definition of level five is really based on nodal drainage and lymphatic drainage from structures in the scalp, nasopharynx, and retropharynx for um, aerodigestive tract and, and parotid and, and, and scalp cancers. But thyroid cancer drains a little bit differently. It drains through the uh, lymphatics associated with the inferior thyroid veins to level four, and the transverse cervical vessels, which give rise to the inferior thyroid artery, are really the, the pathway that you want to follow. So the transverse cervical artery and vein are really in level 5B and 4, or coming from 4 into 5B. And so I follow those vessels routinely out laterally into the inferior part of uh, level 5 and don't identify the spinal accessory nerve more posteriorly where it enters the trapezius muscle. But the transverse cervical vessels are really the key to the lymphatic drainage in levels 4 and 5B and in, really in the lower neck. So I don't really often use frozen section there, but uh, whenever there's a questionable uh, node that might be inflammatory, um, especially if the ultrasound appearance is inflammatory, I'll, I'll liberally use frozen section to guide whether I should dissect that. Okay, so we have some other questions that I want to get to, but just from the receiving end, which, you know, Bob Levine is reading your path reports with a lateral neck dissection, you already mentioned you're kind of assessing us a little bit on a lymph node ratio. So is there a certain nodal yield you as an endocrinologist, Bob, expect? 
when a lateral neck is done. You hear all the variability in what a lateral neck is. What do you below which say, this is not legit, I'm not happy with this? I would say anything under about 8 to 10, I'm very suspicious of. I don't think I need the 25 and up that I sometimes get, um, but, but I'm nervous if I'm seeing fewer than 10 from a, from a lateral neck dissection. This lymph node ratio issue is very important, and I think you, you don't want the extremes. You don't want three of three nodes positive. You also don't want zero of 300 nodes positive. Mm -hmm. You know, you want some healthy ratio. What that is, 60%, 50%, 30% is not really clear to me, but lymph node ratio, I think, is an important, uh, thoughtful uh, aspect of nodal yield. And, and a question? Uh, Abhishek Vaidya from India. I just wanted to know, is there a consensus about the nodal basins to be cleared in a therapeutic neck dissection? In other words, if one of the nodal basins is positive, let's say the pretracheal is positive, does it mandate the performance of contralateral basins as well? So we, we have just covered that issue as it relates to the lateral neck, but what I'll do is then turn that question on its head and talk about something that I actually want to talk about with my I want to be safe hat wearing. And this idea of, you know, there's a lot of potential complication in the bilaterality of a central neck. And so I, I think that's a great excuse to look hard before you do an aggressive bilateral central neck dissection. Even in medullary carcinoma, you know, there's a tumor side where you go a little crazy and maybe take out the inferior parathyroid, and then there, at least for sporadic disease, a non-tumor side where you can kind of go a little easier, perhaps. Um, so that, what, what, but then there are other compartments other than what Lisa mentioned about the two lateral, two lateral paratracheal regions. There are also prelaryngeal and pretracheal as well. So Lisa, we'll just go down the line. Lisa. Like if you have a single, maybe I'll interpret the question, if you have a single right paratracheal node that's a centimeter, what else do you do as part of your therapeutic central neck dissection? Exactly. Prelaryngeal, pretracheal, left and right yes. paratracheal. You have one right, one centimeter paratracheal node. What do you do? So I do the right paratracheal and pretracheal as part of the uh, the higher risk part of the central neck. The prelaryngeal and pretracheal uh, are, are certainly lower risk than the paratracheal. So um, it's a separate component of the central neck to go up to the prelaryngeal region, but I think it's, it's worthwhile to clear that area. There's really J very little morbidity. Jerry, what do you think this, when you really get into the compartmental philosophy, it's it's really strange, you know? There are these areas that we were, I mean, it's blended with surgical convenience, anatomy, as well as, most importantly, the biology of where the nodes are. So there's a lot of strange components into that compartmental. Single right paratracheal node, what exact areas would you do? So for a right paratracheal node, I would do essentially a complete bilateral central neck dissection. I would say that the, the converse is not true. If it's a left paratracheal node, I don't typically do, and the nodes on the right look normal, I don't typically do the part behind the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right. Um, so, if it's so just to articulate exactly what is the difference between left and right paratracheal regions as it relates to nodal hiding places and sure. the RLN anatomy. So on the left side, as many people in the room know, the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve pretty much sticks on the esophagus and trachea coming straight up from the aorta. On the right side, it crosses more obliquely from the, where it wraps around the subclavian artery, and so there's a space posterior to the recurrent laryngeal nerve that has fibro fatty tissue and lymph nodes in it. To completely clear the right paratracheal region requires a 360-degree dissection of the recurrent laryngeal nerve um, to get that tissue out from behind it. I think that's necessary if you're doing a therapeutic lymph node dissection, I think it's excess risk if you're doing, if that part of the operation is prophylactic on the right side. Excellent, great. And uh, Jeff, what would you say? Single right paratracheal node, about one centimeter, not real big or bulky or invasive. What exact areas of the central neck would you do? Yeah, so I'm assuming that this is a grossly visible lymph node that's there. And so then you're talking about a therapeutic dissection. <laughs> I would do both sides. I think the concerns raised by Jerry, are, you know, make sense. But you need to look down on that. You know, let's say you're talking about a left-sided node. You still need to look 
down by that, behind that uh, right recurrent laryngeal nerve and if you're doing a bilateral and see if there's something there. But um, I, I think once you open up that space, you can safely decide at that point whether there's something there that's important. Now, so, so we've had the three surgeons weigh in. Let me ask the person receiving the path report. Single one centimeter right paratracheal node, that's what all that you know about in the central neck. What do you want dissected? I don't think I can add to what they've already <laughs> Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. In that can case, I, oh, uh, I, yes, can I please, just make yes. a point about, of course. there's one other place in the central neck that I think you, one needs to pay attention to, and that's where the recurrent laryngeal nerve pierces the cricopharyngeus muscle. And very often there's a small node there. Now that, that may be negative, but um, I've seen some big nodes in that situation too where the nerve is draped over it, it's, it's stuck, it's a real challenge, but you need to look there. And I think especially if you're gonna do a central neck dissection, you should look and try to get that node out of there, even if it looks benign, because it may become metastatically involved and then create problems in terms of the nerve or the larynx later on. Excellent point. The morbidity of re-resecting that nerve yeah. is I mean, that's a nerve you're going to have to take, probably, right? Jatin. Uh, Greg, I'm a bit troubled by the liberty taken in defining lateral neck dissection by the panelists. One of you showed recurrence rate of 20 to 30 percent after therapeutic neck dissection. That reflects the degree of inad inadequacy of initial operation. Very Let me good finish. Point. I'm Very not, good not point. done yet. So if we just do level three and four, then don't complain if the patient comes with disease at level two. So where, where does the panel draw the line for a comprehensive compartmental therapeutic lateral neck dissection? There are reports in the literature, some from our institution, showing the recurrence rate to be 3% after therapeutic neck dissection. And it is as high as 30%. So I relate that to the inadequacy of initial operation. Quite uh, amusingly, and I'm perplexed, that the panel wants to do bilateral central no node dissection for a single ipsilateral node and compromise the lateral neck. I would like an explanation. Okay, so now who is gonna provide Jotin with that explanation? I mean, you've heard, you've heard from these people who are doing thyroid cancer surgery all the time, have written much of the literature that we, are, that we learn, that the lateral neck dissection is variably defined. We know, though, in the literature, the, that 21% recurrence rate is what is available in the literature. I'd have to say, if that were my series of recurrence after therapeutic neck dissection, I'd put a bullet in my head. But that is, if you look in the literature, how, what is the nodal recurrence rate after therapeutic dissection, it is that over 20%. So does any of the panelists have any comments about I guess the two issues brought up are this variability in def definition of the lateral neck and that recurrence rate number, and also this issue of bilaterality of the paratracheal region. Any takers? I completely agree with the comment that uh, what's called recurrent disease is almost always persistent disease. And so I think it gets back to how this panel started with preoperative imaging being a key part of the decision making in terms of the extent of lateral neck dissection. I, as I said, my routine is to do 2A, 3, 4, and 5B. I don't do 5A and I don't do 2A routinely, but if I have disease at the limit of 2A or at the limit of 5B, I will do the complete, one, uh, complete 2 through 5. So I, I do have somewhat of a systematic approach to that lateral neck, but I'm also making the decision to do the lateral neck based on um, I would have to say that, that agrees with, with, I mean, I'm addicted to the x-rays mm -hmm. and have an overarching, but I can ramp back on my philosophy of compartmental neck mm -hmm. dissection. So, but it's always that I got the money in my pocket because yeah. I got those black dots and I know yeah. I've encompassed the radiographic disease. So the same that we deal with, so it's ramped back based on with my map as my security blanket. 
that I have to get that. If I drop a few quarters as I'm leaving the bank, as Lee's going, I got the, the big ba bag of money in my <laughs> hand, I'm okay if I drop a few quarters. But I want to make sure at least I've got the radiographically identified uh, nodes in my pocket. We do that with central neck dissection, right? In other words, if we know there's a lower paratracheal node, we take it out and then we dissect the nerve up to complete our central neck dissection, and it's incredibly scarred, we generally tone back our superior dissection and take what we can easily get out and, and not go after a section of the compartment that doesn't have any radiographically evident targets in it. But and, and it comes back to who is doing the surgery nationwide. And if I send a patient to you, I know that there's going to be a very low recurrence rate. When I get the patient coming to me after they have had surgery and now they're coming to see me for the first time and more than 50% of those patients have been done by a surgeon who is doing less than a dozen cases a year, they will have done a lateral neck dissection without the central neck dissection. They, they will have done uh, a single compartment. And that's where it's, they had their lateral neck dissection but they're going to have that 20, 30 percent mm. recurrence rate. Any other comments? Well, I would say that surgical quality is a clear driver of the outcomes of this situation. And there's no question that we use a selective approach to the levels of the neck that are included in the dissection based on the imaging. Um, and that does not lead to a 20 percent recurrence rate, except possibly in adolescents. I think that's yeah. the one group that has a, a high recurrence rate that's different biologically from, from the Also adults. in cystic nodes, at least I've had sympathetic endocrinologists, like I'm there, they console me when I have a nodal recurrence where it wasn't there one month and then the next month there's this big cystic <laughs> node and they say, but there was a small little thing and you didn't see it. And so perhaps that's one way we can console ourselves in adolescence and with cystic node recurrence. So uh, perhaps I'm just uh, it's false sense of security, though, perhaps. Anyway, thank you very much. We're out of time now. We do have now a break. Thank you very much for all of our panelists. We have a break now, so you're invited to the exhibit hall. There's the e-poster session there also for a break. But we return back here at 4 p.m. So we'd like you to be back in the room to continue the program at 4 p.m., please. Thank you.